When I was in college, I was part of a Christian group. I know, I know, I seem like the last person to ever be in one of those, but at the time I didn't care so much about the atheism religion stuff. I joined because they were the nicest people imaginable and I wanted to have a reason to hang out with them. Anyway, I would follow them to do all sorts of stuff like Bible study, singing religious songs, and there were plenty of fun activities too, like laser tag. One such event was listening to a speaker go over the evidence for God. For an hour or so, we listened to him present one argument and one argument only, the fine tuning of the universe. I have to say, this is definitely one of the more popular ones. Claiming that, say, the earth is in a perfectly habitable zone isn't something incredibly difficult to understand and can easily convince someone who isn't used to thinking in a scientific way. So let's talk about it a bit, shall we? Here's a video of someone making a bunch of fine-tuning arguments and we're gonna go over them one by one. He also does present something new and I was interested. The moon is 400 times closer to earth than the sun and the sun is 400 times larger than the moon. What does this mean? Interesting question. What does it mean? Could it just be perhaps the work of Zeus himself? It means that when the moon comes in between the sun and the earth, they both seem the same size to us, such that we form a perfect eclipse. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, that's standard stuff, mate. It's not standard stuff because in our solar system, there are approximately 166 moons and that never happens to any other planet because either the moon seems too big or the sun seems too big. But why is it that only on earth? It's so specific. It's as if Allah is trying to tell us something. What could Allah possibly tell us from that? Let's sit here and think about it for a bit. What kind of hidden message could he possibly encrypt here? Hmm. Nah, uh, well I got nothing. For all I know, Allah could be telling you that the doomsday is coming or something like that. The point is, you guys are always trying to see something that doesn't exist in patterns that are either mere coincidences or don't mean anything at all. The moon covering the sun during an eclipse sure is a great sight, but it doesn't have to have a meaning behind it. And if you think about it, there are plenty of good things God could do, like make it so cancer doesn't exist. Instead, he gives us a pretty eclipse. Wow, I'm so grateful. Also, not to mention that the moon is slowly receding from the earth at about 4 centimeters per year, meaning eventually the moon will not perfectly covered the sun in an eclipse. So I guess in the far future the hidden message God is trying to tell us will expire. Better figure out what it means before then. Now as we know when the universe was created we had hydrogen and helium but we need carbon for life to exist. I actually like how you brought up this point because now I can go on an irrelevant rant about how important carbon is. It is the most essential atom for life due to its valence, electron numbers, and thus ability to form four covalent bonds. This gives it the ability to form long chains and become the basis for many essential molecules. Carbon is so important we have an entire field of chemistry dedicated to it, organic chemistry. That was one of the more difficult classes I had to take in college. Just thinking about how our exams had an average score of 30% gives me nightmares. Anyway, so if an atom that can form four covalent bonds be the most essential composition for life, why can't silicon. After all, this metalloid can also form four bonds. Good fucking question. I'm glad you asked that. Unlike carbon, silicon doesn't form versatile bonds with oxygen. One of the best properties of carbon is its ability to be easily oxidized and reduced. In metabolic biochemistry, that's a very important part of energy usage and storage. Silicon doesn't have that property and thus will always remain an inferior atom. Sorry silicon, leave the big job to the big boys. Uh, wait, where were we again? Hydrogen and helium is all well and good, but to form carbon, you need three heliums to come together to form carbon. So there's this scientist called Sir Fred Hoyle. He wanted to see how these three heliums come together. So of course in the lab, they do what they gotta do, but he noticed that nothing really was happening. So then it occurred to him that maybe these three heliums will come together at a specific resonance. In other words, there has to be a specific nuclear ground state energy. Okay, I don't think Sir Fred Hoyle actually tried to make carbon in his lab with helium. He just made a calculated prediction that the excited nuclear state of carbon-12 had to be at 7.7 .7 mega electron volts, and precisely at 7.7. .7. I don't know why you said the nuclear ground state energy, because Hoyle was talking about the excited nuclear state, but whatever, minor details. And he noticed that if it was different, for even 1% the heliums would not come together to form carbon. After discovering this, Hoyle later confessed that nothing has shaken his atheism more than this discovery. 
Yes, it's true that this calculation of his did play a role in making Hoyle more religious, but whether or not it convinced him is irrelevant to if this is actual evidence for a creator. Now, the predicted state in which carbon-12 had to be in was called the Hoyle state, named after the man himself. Later on, scientists were actually able to test it, and yes, apparently the Hoyle state exists, and it was mapped out quite clearly to look like a bent arm. Don't ask me for the details, I'm not a physicist. Anyway, it turns out that his calculations weren't as correct as he thought they were. Yes, the state exists, but it wasn't nearly as precise as Hoyle thought it would be. In fact, there was quite a range above and below 7.7 mega electron volts, which also varied depending on if other parameters were changed. The idea of the original argument is that the Hoyle state was so precise that it doesn't account for the vast number of carbon atoms that we see today. But apparently, the range can go past even 0.2 difference in the Hoyle state and the amount of carbon in the universe would still be accounted for. This is credited to other scientists who tested it after the claim was made. Admittedly, I don't understand it all myself, but it's simply dishonest to announce that this is what science is when only one scientist has made the claim. It's important to look at all the scientific research in it and the scientific consensus before presenting something like this as fact. As we know, the sun and the earth is at a reasonable distance. Yeah, if it was too close, we'd all burn. If it was too further away, we'd all freeze. If this relationship between earth and the sun changed for even 2%, there'd be no life on this planet, guys. That's how much is finely tuned. Well, the distance the planet has to be from the star for life to exist really measures if liquid water would exist or not. This is called the Goldilocks zone, given the proper atmospheric pressure that is. So in that sense, the range of the zone would differ depending on the atmosphere. There have been many estimates to the range of the Goldilocks zone, but it generally floats around 0.1 to 0.3 astronomical units for the inner edge, and 0.3 to 3 for the outer edge. Astronomical units is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, so we can use these as percentages. It can be about 10 to 30 percent. What was the number you claimed again? Right, 2 percent. Hmm, doesn't seem like you're right here. Plus, there are so many other planets and other solar systems that fall within the Goldilocks zone for their respective stars. Don't think that we're special in any way, shape or form. As we know, everything is made from atoms, but there's two forces that are holding atoms together. You've got the electromagnetic force, which holds the structure of the atom, and then you've got the nuclear strong force, which holds the nucleus of the atom. These two have to be at a specific ratio for life to exist. Now what's this ratio? Let me tell you, it's 1 over 10 to the power 16. 10 to the power 16 is 10 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 16 times. Now that is very, very specific. Uh, what? You're talking about ratios here. So are you dividing the strength of the electromagnetic interaction with that of the strong interaction? In that case, the final number you came up with, 1 in 10 to the power of 16, isn't amazing just because it's small. Now if you said something about it being that precise, then sure, but you're just talking about ratios here. And that ratio isn't even correct, it's 1 in 137 approximately. So yeah, I feel like you're actually talking about something else and then stumbled upon your words, so I can't grill you too hard on this. At the dawn of the Big Bang, there was something called dark energy which is pushing our universe out there. Now this is so finely tuned that if this force was too much, the universe would have exploded and nothing would have formed. If it was too less, it would have collapsed upon itself and again, nothing would have formed. Now how much is this force? Well let me tell you mate, it's 1 over 10 to the power 120. That is very, very specific. You know, it's difficult to interpret what you're saying when you're being so vague, not telling us exactly what the 10 and 120 is and what it refers to. So naturally I went on the internet for clues. The results I tend to encounter are ones talking about the cosmological constant problem, saying how the difference between a theorized energy and observed energy is that of the order of 10 to the power of 120, which became so famous it was coined the worst theoretical prediction in the history of physics. Solutions for this problem were proposed and the anthropic principle was one of them, which I'm not a huge fan of myself, but I somehow doubt you were talking about that, so what could it be? Then. Apparently two arguments of fine tuning were presented here. One, the density parameter which would affect the force of gravity and the force of dark energy. Two, the cosmological constant itself which is the ratio between the density of dark energy to that of the universe. And it does appear that these values have to be relatively specific for stars and planets to form, but this just appeals to an overall grand fallacy that creationists use and is against the scientific method. An idea is only proven to be true once there is reasonable elimination of all other possible explanations. For example, in a universe so big or with the possibility of multiverses, some 
parts of it are bound to be suitable for life. And it's only when an observer emerges, no matter how low the chances, can the observer then question what makes it possible for it to be there. These other possibilities must be eliminated, or that there has to be sufficient evidence that an intelligent designer is the one and only explanation, can we then say that potentially there is a designer? This is an important part of the thinking process when it comes to the scientific method, and once you apply it, would invalidate really any fine-tuning arguments you present for God. Well, the fine-tuning argument, guys, it's such a solid proof for the existence of a designer that atheists go to great lengths to disprove these minute, minute probabilities. In fact, the best thing they've come up with is the multiverse theory, which what they've said is there's an infinite amount of universes out there, so the chance of a universe or a solar system or a planet like ours forming is actually probable. But guys, there's no proof of the multiverse theory. It's just a hypothesis at this moment in time. Yes, there isn't proof of the multiverse theory, but it has been suggested mathematically. Even so, the fact that the multiverse theory exists would automatically give less credit to the intelligent designer hypothesis. Ideas hold weight when they are more probable or when all other options have been eliminated. So the fact that the multiverse theory exists would put a dent in the idea of an intelligent designer. That's the way of the scientific method. Anyway, that's my time. Thank you for sitting through to the end of this video. I know it can get kind of boring. Shoutouts to my top patrons, Fireshard, Shere Khan, and Elliot. Without you and all my other patrons, my work here wouldn't be possible. Thank you.